Okay, Chris, what is tip number five, please? Uh, another one that's kind of quite close to my heart. Um, I think we need to take pains to depressurize learning. I think we forget sometimes what a strange circumstance it is that children learn in. They are learning lots of stuff for the first time in a room full of their peers who are often their circle of friends. Um, they are developing as human beings at the same time as learning this stuff. And so the potential for um, negative emotions, negative relationships with that learning content to develop um, is there's a real potential for that and we want to avoid it. Um, in particular, I think about the time that I spent working for a couple of years specifically with groups of children in year five and six who had um, fallen out of love with learning completely. They had struggled and they needed to be kind of turned round effectively in their attitudes towards learning. And when I kind of dug down into what had happened in their learning experiences and when I thought back to my times as a TA I recognised something in particular in the classroom we want children to become more resilient we want them to deal, be able to deal with all sorts of emotions so a small amount of excitement, over excitement and fear and frustration and disappointment that's, that's natural and that's healthy in small doses but there's one particular emotion, one particular feeling that I think is toxic for learning. Even in the smallest of doses, is so it's like the cyanide of learning. And that is humiliation or embarrassment. And it's almost impossible to avoid entirely. Pupils will be embarrassed relating to learning in class. And an essential thing that we need to do is to develop a set of strategies that support us to minimise that embarrassment when it happens and to preempt it and prevent it where we can. So it, that's all well, all well and good in theory. Let me talk about some practical um, examples of that. So for example, I don't tend to ever say that uh, a question or a bit of learning that we're doing is easy. Or even if two pupils have had a go at it for a while, I'll never say, oh yeah, you can do this now, this is easy stuff. Because there is nothing more pressurizing than being told, here's a thing you might fail at, it's really easy. That is a terrifying proposition. So I never ever talk about easy. You, and, and one thing I've noticed about working with students that struggle in particular is they have a very uh, unique almost relationship with the idea of difficulty with work. They, are, they tend to go from one extreme to the other. Something is impossible, I can't do it, I don't get this at all. Then as soon as they begin to understand something, they're right to the other end of the spectrum. This is easy, I can do this. And they're just, and you think, oh, easy. Because hold off there a little because you might struggle in a moment and I don't want you to feel so, so what I tend to do is try and reframe this conversation around difficulty by saying everything we learn is tricky everything we learn is tricky you might find it to it might feel easier once you've done loads of practice but everything is tricky while we're learning it so reframing that conversation and saying to pupils, if they say, oh, this is easy, actually saying, well, hang on a minute, I think this is still really tricky. If you've done lots and lots of practice and it feels easy now, great, but don't worry if there are some struggles because this is really tricky stuff. So always selling stuff as tricky. I don't overdo it. I don't say, this is impossible. You'll never learn this stuff. I always say, we can do this, but it's tricky is um, I think a, a sensible way to depressurize learning. There are loads of other things you can do though. So. Um, Maybe this is something that applies more to young children, but I think it might apply to older children as well. If I want to ask a kind of question that has a relatively simple right or wrong answer of the class, and for whatever reason I'm not going to use mini whiteboards, I'm going to ask individual students, I don't tend to ask one child who gives me an answer and then I say, well, yes, that's right, or no, that's wrong. What I tend to do is I'll ask five or six pupils, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think? And then I'll say, and actually the answer is this. I'm not responding at that then to any individual student. Um, if one or two of the pupils have got it wrong, by the time I've had all that feedback, it's not really that one person has got it wrong. No one's really noticing who's got it right or wrong at that point. We're just discussing things as a class. So if I'm looking to ask, for whatever reason, a right or wrong answer, I don't tend to then say, this is right or this is wrong, directly to that one student immediately. I'll ask a group and then clearly explain what the right answer is and why. Um, another thing, so if I'm giving answers out in a class, if we've done a quiz, say, and I'm saying, well, this is the answer to number one, this is the answer to number two, this is the answer to number three, etc. 
may be a primary thing again, but I think I've seen it in secondary, certainly in year seven um, in the past as well. Kids might start to go, as they're ticking their answers, like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and there, st there starts to be this little chorus of appreciation for themselves that they've got it right. Now, I always like to ask the question, and if, if you take one thing away from this tip, it's this. It's, how does the child who's got this wrong feel right now? And, and can I minimise, if there's a negative feeling, can I minimise that? Because those students going, yes, 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 is just not a pleasant thing for the person who is, who's got these things wrong. They've tried their best, they haven't quite learned it yet, this doesn't make sense, and they've got this thing ringing in their ears. So I, I put a stop to that. I say, okay, can you, um, no, I don't want to hear, hear yeses. If you're really glad you've got it right, fantastic. Keep that for yourself, though, for now just because I'm always hyper aware of how this feels for, um, your other, for the students that maybe haven't understood something. My, my favorite depressurizing de strategy though, is if a kid does get something wrong and there's this moment of social embarrassment, I would as quickly as possible say, oh, you know what, when I was learning this, that's exactly what I got wrong. I got that wrong as well because on the assumption that I hope the class see me as someone who's relatively competent and confident in the subject. Me saying, yep, we're in the same boat. I, I got that wrong as well. You're well on your way to learning it the way I have is just a way to share that social embarrassment and just to take the pressure down um, as much as I, as I possibly can. So yeah, oh, just, just one last one as well, because I know this doesn't quite relate to learning in the same way, but I think it's, it's connected. One of the things, uh, I remember in my um, NQT year, we had a, a non-uniform day and all the teachers as well as the pupils were encouraged to turn up in, um, in non-uniform. And I turned up without my usual shirt and tie. And there were a couple of kids who had forgotten and or who, who hadn't got the letter and they felt embarrassed. And from then on, I always forget. I always turn up in my shirt and tie so that when that pupil comes in the room and they've got that look on their face of, oh, I can't believe I forgot non-uniform day I, I can say the same thing like yep me too I forgot oh, just and, and, like a bit of embarrassment shared just doesn't feel anywhere like as toxic so yeah just finding ways to think about the, the student who's got something wrong in that moment and to make them not feel quite so embarrassed or humiliated is at the heart of good teaching I think Flipping it, Chris. I think there's a big claim alert coming here. This is one of the most important tips we've we've had so far on on this series. I th it's it's such a biggie. This it's such a biggie. Just just two things from me on this. I think you've 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 done the theory and you've come up with some amazing practical ways. So just a, just a couple of things from me. The first is I'm I'm a massive um, advocate of of what Dylan again Dylan William what Dylan William calls tools of mass participation. So things like mini whiteboards, ABCD cards, and so on. With with the theory being. If a question's good enough, if you think a question is good enough to ask, you want to get as many responses to that question as possible. Now, the thing is, I don't know if you've, you've experienced this yourself, but particularly with like ABCD cards, where if you use a diagnostic question, particularly if they're coloured, kids will do this kind of tactical delay where you'll say, okay, three, two, one, show me your responses. And you'll get a few kids who'll just hold fire, just check that everyone else is thinking a similar thing to them. And then they'll kind of stick theirs up. And the problem with that, of course, you... All, immediately you lose all the benefits of mass participation because all, now there's a kind of consensus to copy what the kind of so-called smartest kid in the class is, is doing and so on. I, I always sense that that is tools of mass participation. One thing that people don't seem to appreciate by them is that there's potential for embarrassment there, right? Like if, mm. if everyone's showing their responses and you have thought of something different, you've got to be quite a confident kid to first stick with that response and not, you know, and resist the temptation to change. But then also as a teacher, I'm fascinated as to why you think what you think. But that takes some confident kid then to, as you say, to kind of sift through the embarrassment and say, no, I do think the answer's B, even though everyone else thinks it's C and the chances are I'm wrong. It just sends to me, it just feels to me that this, these tools of mass participation, that's kind of one side effect to them that we need to be aware of as a teacher, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and I think an essential part of that, if I may go back to the... If, if I anecdotally talk about the times that I worked with students that were really struggled with that, who they were the kids who for years and years had been the kid who held up the whiteboard, it was not the right answer. And it's tempting to say that, well, put aside this stuff, there's just effective ways of teaching and we've got to use them from the very beginning. I think that um, with most classes, there is a sense in which 
you have to balance the possibility for embarrassment with um, these other considerations. And what I mean by that is if you have got a class who are really struggling with um, social embarrassment, they haven't developed a sense that they are mostly successful in your subject, then you might need to tone this stuff down. Even if you think of it as the most brilliant, most effective yeah. pedagogical tool that you've got to hand, you might need to put that to a side for a little while. So uh, thinking about the children that I worked with, what I wanted to do straight away was to give them lots and lots of um, challenging maths and writing bits and lots and lots of struggle straight away because I know how productive that can be when done well. But I recognised fairly quickly that, now I've got to get these kids on board first. They need to feel kind of successful in mathematics, kind of successful with spelling, kind of successful with writing, reading, etc. before I can start using this um, this sense of productive struggle. So there is always this trade-off um, with a lot of these tools. And the question is, and I guess that's the art of teaching rather than the, the science behind it, that, that, that side of going, okay, so at what point am I prioritizing this, sen this relationship with the subject that I'm trying to, to develop with them? And at what point am I prioritizing just the most effective pedagogical tool? Because I recognize they're at a stage where they can deal with the odd wrong answer here or there. And that can be over a longer period of time, but it can also be in a lesson. If you think, I've asked a couple of things and a few students have struggled and I can see there are there's some heads dropping here, it might be to think, well, we're gonna do some bits and pieces for a while where I know I'll be able to, be, I'll know I'll be able to rebuild that sense of success with them. I'm gonna do that for 10 or 15 minutes. I'm not gonna do this next bit because they're not quite ready for that struggle. So reflecting, not just, so in, it, it comes back in some ways to formative assessment, but you're not just assessing what have they learned. You're also assessing how, it, what's their relationship with the subject like in this moment right now? And how can I um, adapt my instruction in light of that? That's fascinating that. I, I often think of this in terms of, you get people who, let's take mini whiteboards or whatever it may be, they invest time into getting the routine right for mini whiteboards. And that may mean in the short term, they go a lot slower than a teacher who just kind of dives straight in and says, we use mini whiteboards. But that investment pays off in the long term because the kids, you know, develop this routine um, and they're much quicker at using them and so on. But it almost feels to me like another investment we need to make before we start using these tools is to make sure we've got this right culture in the classroom where kids have got this foundation of success. They're not afraid to be wrong, being wrong seen as a natural part of learning. If we don't invest in that as well, then as you say, it doesn't matter how effective the pedagogical tool is. If the kids aren't willing to participate, then, you know, forget about it. So yeah, that feels really, really important. And that's a whole school culture thing as well. It's quite possible that you will inherit, um, again, primary, the idea of inheriting a whole class, but it's quite possible you will inherit a class yeah. who maybe struggle with the subject, but have developed a pretty um, decent relationship with it, where you can go straight in with these pedagogical tools that might cause a little bit of social embarrassment because they're used to it, they're ready for it, they know that in the end they're successful. You know, So it isn't necessarily that you always have to start the year with this stuff. It will depend on the class, it depends on the culture across the school, um, etc. But it is something to bear in mind, I think. Brilliant. And the final thing just on this, just, just a quick one here. I love this idea, and I'm going to do this now, Chris, of, of banning the word easy from my vocabulary when I'm talking about things. I, it's going to be hard for me because I must say it about a million times, but I'm, it's, it's got to go. I, I completely agree. The other one you often hear is smart, not describing kids as, as smart. And I, I guess it's for the same reason, right? Like if you tell a kid that they're smart, then all of a sudden that kid can't be wrong because then by d definition, they're not smart. Would, would, would that be something that you'd kind of try and avoid as well for a similar reason? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know that there's um, the research into things like growth mindset is um, debated rather than absolutely certain. But putting aside the research and just thinking about my experiences, and I know that that's a that's a difficult <laughs> so that's a very dangerous thing to say for someone who likes to consider myself relatively informed by evidence. But just thinking about that, just of my personal experiences, telling kids that they're clever and telling them that they're smart particularly in front of other kids is it's just I, I just don't see the the value of it. I, I, it it suggests that we that we value something that is inherent inherent to them rather yeah. than something that they can develop so yeah i, I absolutely I, I i at heart i agree with the idea of not really trying to talk about kids being intelligent or smart i want to talk about 
what they can do and what they can do now and what they're going to be able to do in the future. I know that sounds a bit instrumentalist, but that's that's where I'm at. And I think, yeah, I, I can't think of the last time that I've wanted or felt the need to describe a kid and say, oh, well done, you must be really smart. And again, mm. just thinking back to that class that I've had, of all the kids, of, you can guarantee for, that for every um, relatively high attaining child there is who's been called smart or for every time they've been called smart it is the it, it, the kids that are called smart in my experience the most and who develop the most odd and, un, and unproductive relationships counterproductive relationships i should say with words like this it's the children who are struggling with attainment because teachers go to the other end of the spectrum they'll draw a picture or they will um, answer some math questions and they'll say oh can i go and show this to someone and invariably they'll say wow aren't you smart so and again, how, what, a, what an incredible way to pressurise the learning that they've done. You've got ten right, you're smart. Well, what happens when they've got five? How do they feel when they get two? So, yeah, I, 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 even if necessarily we don't have the research to back it up, on a personal level, I am, I am very big into the, the emotional side that we, that we deal with when it comes to things like growth mindset. Amazing. 